Hi, this is Pat Love with Pat's Two Cents. We're God's Church of Love Online, and we have an encouraging word for many of you who struggle with God. All right, we're going to start with Luke chapter 4, and we're going to that right now. Luke chapter 4, starting at verse 16. This is Jesus announcing his job description. You know, you go to a job and you sit down, you apply for it, and you read the list of the different duties you must perform for that particular job. Well, here we go. Starting at verse 16. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as a custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Verse 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it to the minister and sat down and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now, a lot of times when we hear that scripture where he says he's preaching the gospel to the poor, we're not only talking about folks that don't have change in their pocket. You know, your, your money's funny, your change is strange. We're not just talking about that kind of poor. There are many of you who are poor in spirit. It's, a, a, it's an emotional deficit, so to speak. I call it having holes in your soul. And there are wounded people out there. When he talks about he came to heal the brokenhearted, preach deliverance to the captives, the, uh, give sight to the blind, give it liberty them that are bruised. There are broken, bruised, hurting people out there. And that is one of the main focal points of Jesus, besides forgiving us for sin, being the sacrificial lamb, killing the power of sin over us, and taking away the penalty, paying it himself on the cross, taking all of our sicknesses, physical, mental, psychological, emotional, all of our sicknesses and nailing them to the cross by the stripes he had on his back. So what I want to share with you is what Jesus came to do. Jesus is not in a hurry because he knows what he's going to do. It's just like when you're baking a cake, you're not in a hurry. You know all the ingredients that you need and you start mixing and breaking the eggs and pouring in the flour. You know all the mixing and how long it's going to take to get the mix correct before you can pour the batter and stick it in the oven. The oven has to be at a certain temperature. All of this takes strategic planning and time. It's not all done in five minutes. After you put that cake in the oven, you got to sit and wait for that baby to bake, for it to rise. Some of us don't want to wait for God to help us rise. We want it now. And I get that. Most of us are like that. We don't want to wait. And the Bible is always saying, wait on the Lord. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Hmm. All right. So let's go to Luke chapter 24. I just wanted you to hear the job description of Jesus' calling. Because there's so much more to him than what we realize. And we we know as we follow on to know, but we must follow on to know. Luke chapter 24. This is the one that God gave me a revelation I never saw before. And I want to share it with you. 
I'm going to read it to you. Mm -hmm. Verse 13. And behold, two of them. Let me let me start at verse. Let's see, verse 12. Then arose Peter and ran into the sepulchre. Stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves and departed, wondering in, in himself at that which was come to pass. What had just come to pass was Jesus rose from the dead. He's not in the tomb anymore. So, verse 13. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Now check this out. But their eyes were holding that they should not know him. You hear that? But their eyes were holding that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communication are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? And the one of them whose name was Cleopas, or Cleopas, however you pronounce it, answering said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem and has not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers did deliver him to condemn to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And besides all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and a certain woman also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And a certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found that even so as the woman had said, but him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them all the scriptures and the things concerning him. And they drew nigh unto the village whither they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it, and brake, and gave to them. And their eyes were open. And they knew him. In other words, they recognized him and he vanished out of their sight. Let's stop right there. Let's stop right there. Some of you have no idea, no more than the men on Emmaus Road, that Christ is right in your midst, all in your business. But you don't feel him. You don't see him. You don't recognize him. He's right there, y'all. He's right there. Just because you don't see him, just because you don't feel him, does not mean. He's not there. Check that out. These men followed Jesus, but they did not recognize him when he walked along with them along that road, asking them little silly questions. No, no, no. They didn't recognize him because he was not to be recognized. Do you notice what the scripture said? He had hold, he had closed their eyes. It wasn't time for them to recognize him. Mm -hmm. See, that's one of the things that we don't realize. God is in control of what we see, what we grasp, what we understand, and when that happens. He's in control of all of it. And when we get frustrated because we haven't experienced him yet, because we haven't heard his voice, because we haven't seen his face. We wonder, well, what's it all about, Alfie? Has he forgotten about me? No. No. 
These men had gone through mourning. They watched their Savior die on the cross. And they were expecting him to come and rescue the Jews. And he dies. Doesn't it sound like he lied? But he didn't lie. They expect him to be dead in the tomb. The body ain't even there. They don't know what's going on. They're beside themselves. And they don't even recognize the fact that Jesus is right there with them right now. Right now. Right there with them on that road. They're missing him. They're mourning him. And he's right there, y'all. All that time, he was right there in their midst, and they didn't even realize it. Because they're so encumbered with mourning and heaviness. All the disappointments that go with mourning, that go with death, that go with the fact that they had to witness the cruelty of him being on the cross, dying on the cross. What happened to all the promises? Like the guy said in one of the movies I watched, he's dead now. Yeah, well, now he's dead. Now what do you do? Now what are you left with? You don't know he's risen from the dead. You don't recognize it because you don't see him. You're looking at him, but you don't see him. Ain't that something? Talk about not seeing the forest for the trees. That's the same thing. Many of you... Jesus is walking right there by your side, but you don't see it because you got your own mind made up how you want that package to be delivered. Jesus is in the middle of delivering, in the middle of fulfillment, but you don't see it. So you get mad, you get disgusted, you get desperate, you get frustrated, you're disappointed, you're sad, you're depressed, and he's right there. These men were in mourning. They were disappointed. It looked like everything God said he was going to do fell right through. Look at him on the cross. He's dead in the tomb. Now they can't even find his body. Now what's up? Now what's next? And they don't even know. God is right there in their midst. How much, how glorious that must have been for them to recognize it once Jesus decided to open their eyes. See, many of you, what does the Bible say? Run and not be weary. Walk and not faint. You got to keep on because you never know when he's going to show up. And when he shows up, you will say in your heart, it's been worth the wait. It's been worth the tears. It's been worth it all. Because one encounter with God fixes so much that you can't even imagine until you have that encounter. And once you have the encounter, you have to know that your eyes are open because you won't know you got an encounter. He'll be right in your midst, right involved in your life. Break, giving you breakthroughs, giving you all kind of, showing you all kind of mercies and protection. But you don't recognize it because you don't see him. And if you don't see him, you ain't believing him. But that does not negate the fact that he's right there in your midst. Hmm. And when God says it's time, many of you get tired of that term, the fullness of time. When God says time, your eyes are going to be open and, and you're going to, he's going to run you down memory lane and warp speed. And you're going to recognize oh, that was God. That was God. Oh my God. I didn't rec Lord, that was you. Oh, yeah. All the time he was right there. But so many of us miss it. Just like the men on Emmaus Road. They loved Jesus. They worshipped him. They longed for him. They were mourning for him. And he was right there. The very one they were mourning, the very one they were missing, the very one they thought was a lost cause was talking to them, and they didn't even get it. How many of you 
are being touched by God, blessed by God, protected by God, inspired by God, moved by God, huh? Directed by him, but you don't see him. You don't smell him. You don't hear him. You don't feel him. It doesn't mean he's not there. So don't be disheartened because you haven't experienced him yet. Remember that. God is faithful. He's true to his promises. He's just not on your time clock. That's all. You know, years ago, this is just coming to me right now. Years ago, I used to get so frustrated when I had a date and the date would call and say, I'll be there at six or seven or whatever. And 715 would come. They're not there. My mind would start saying, I might as well get undressed. They're not going to show. They're going to stand me up like everybody else does. But guess what? Show up. Ding dong. What happened? Traffic. They were on their way all the time, but traffic. See, <laughs> some of your blessings are on the way. I mean, they've been on the way all this time. But traffic, what's traffic in your blessing? The demons that try to hinder and delay. The angels that are battling on your behalf to get your blessing to you. Like the prophet said when, uh, uh, I can't think of the guy's name, but he was fasting. He went on a 21-day fast. And the first day of his fast, he had to wait 21 days to see the answer to his prayer. And the angel told him, I had to fight the prince of Persia to get your prayer answered because the, the, the prince of Persia was fighting me from getting your blessing to you. God heard your prayer the first day you prayed it. See, many of you are having a hard time with time real hard time. Your now is yesterday. God's now is whenever he's ready for now to be. And you don't like that. And sometimes that impatience can sour your disposition. That impatience can sour your mood, can, can, can water down the power of your faith. And that's where you have to be careful. You got to say, Lord, help thou mine unbelief. Just keep asking for help. Every time you start to go down that rabbit hole of doubt, frustration, despair, hopelessness, and depression, you ask God, write that on the spot. Don't even go, don't even allow yourself that. See, what happened with the Israelites is when they allowed it, and they spoke it, oh, that made it worse. Because when they spoke it, they took an 11-day or 13-day journey and turned it into a 40-year ordeal. So you always want to, you know, when you find yourself doubting God, you find yourself wondering if he's even thinking about you, ask him to reassure you. Ask him to do it personally. Because people aren't always going to be there. But God knows who to get the message through when to get it to you, and what the message is to say. He knows. He knows. But remember, even though you can't see him, smell him, hear him, feel him, he's right there, just like he was with the men on Emmaus Road. That was the revelation. I never saw that before. I, I knew he was with them, but it never occurred to me that that's what we do in our lives. He's right in our lives, right in the midst, right in, intricately involved. I mean, just all in it. But because we don't see him, hear him, smell him, feel him, we think, oh, God ain't even doing nothing. And all the time he's right there because he's ever present. He's all knowing and he's all powerful. All right. So now let's go to Luke 18. And this is what God wants us to be aware of. He wants us to be persistent because a lot of times when you start to lose heart, you lose your strength. You lose your determination. All of it starts to go down the drain and you want to sit down and just say, forget it. And this is what God says to that. All right. Okay. Go with me to Luke 18 
And we're going to start at verse 1. Then we're going to drop all the way down. There's another little story you need to hear. Both of them are in 18. Persistence, y'all. Persistence. Mm -hmm. Verse 1, And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not faint. Run and not be weary, walk and not faint. Not faint. Verse 2, saying, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded men. In other words, he didn't give a hoot about God. He didn't give a hoot about you, me, or anybody else. And there was a widow in that city. And she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while. <laughs> it was like, whatever, go on, you know, go play on the freeway. But afterwards he said unto himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubled me, nag, 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 I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? See, sometimes the, your crying ain't going to bring an instant answer. Sometimes he's bearing long with you. That means he's sick of you. It means there comes the fullness of time and some things ain't ready yet. I tell you that he will avenge him speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, here's your question. Shall he find faith on earth? Will he find faith on the earth? Will he? Hmm. All right. Now let's scoot all the way down. Mm -hmm. And we are going to. We are going to. Verse 35 to the end. And it came to pass that as he was nigh unto Jericho, a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging. And hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth passes by. And he cried, saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Now check out what they did to him. And they which went before rebuked him. Like, shut up, that he should hold his peace. But what did he do? He cried so much the more. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. In other words, no, I ain't shutting up here. I got a need. And I ain't never going to shut up. That's, that was his attitude. Persistence. And Jesus stood and commanded him to be brought unto him. And when he was come near, he asked him. Now, doesn't this sound like a silly question? Say, what wilt thou that I shall do unto thee? See, there are times God requires you to say it out of your mouth. You get specific with your request. Don't just say, oh, Lord, bless me. No, you get specific. Because the more specific your requests, the more specific your answers will be. All right. And he said, Lord, that I might receive my sight. Well, Jesus already knew that. And Jesus said unto him, receive thy sight. Thy faith has saved thee. And immediately he received the sight and followed him, glorifying God and all the people. When they saw it, gave praise unto God. Now, the blind man was not going to be shut up. No, you ain't going to tell me to shut up. I want to see. And the more they shushed him up, the more the louder he hollered and the longer he hollered till he got Jesus' attention. Because, see, that kind of persistent faith, that's what gets God's attention. Not a little passive, oh, yeah, well, I, I hope that you do this. Um, if you can find time to think about me, I hope you do this for me because uh, I'm, I'm tired. No, 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 no. Lord, sometimes you got to holler. You in your house, in the bathroom, with the shower going by yourself. Sometimes you got to holler your blessings down. That's what the Bible means when it says the kingdom suffers violence. That means the kingdom allows violence. 
and the violent take it by force. You got to snatch your blessing, snatch, claw, grab, scratch, dig, hoop, holler, nag, 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 whatever you got to do. Whatever you do, you don't give up. That's what you do. You don't give up. Because one day, in the fullness of time, Jesus going to show up in a way that you ain't never thought he would for you. Mm -hmm. you be shocked what he'll do. See, the part of us that don't get how much he loves us and the fact that we don't get it means that we don't get that he is love. Love can't help itself. What does love do? It loves. God is love. That's what God is. He's love. He can't, I mean, there's nothing else he can do. He, he loves. And everything he does is based on love. All right. So remember, like the men on Emmaus Road, just because you can't see him, smell him, feel him, hear him does not mean he's not right there in your midst working out all the details. He knows you have need before you even ask. He knows. And he knows exactly what your needs are. But what did he do with the blind man? He made the blind man say exactly what he wanted Jesus to do for him. Jesus knew he was blind. He knows what your problem is. He knows you're hurting. He knows you're worried about what happens on your job. He knows you're nervous about the outcome of this, that, or the other. He knows all your propensities, all your inhibitions, all your hurts, all your everything. But he requires us to speak it out. Speak it out. When I asked the Lord if he was going to relocate us to, to bless me with a, a bedroom that's upstairs with my own terrace, I said, I would love to have that. Milton can have his hot tub. I can have my swimming pool and a pool table to boot. I got real specific, y'all. And what happened? I got exactly what I asked for. We didn't just get a place. We got exactly what we wanted. In the setting, we wanted it in. When I asked the Lord to bless me with that used car that he told me he was going to bless me with in a dream. I said, well, Lord, I know they say when you get a used car, you can't be specific because these people, they're going to give you whatever they got available. But I ask you to make it happen. I want a burgundy on the outside, tan leather on the inside, blah, 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 blah. Down the list. Mm -hmm. I got everything I asked for on that list. First thing the man walked me over to was a burgundy outside, tan, leather, inside, Buick Roadmaster. Hmm. Eight-cylinder engine. Plenty of room for my husband's legs and plenty of room for my big bottom. That's right. Everything I asked for. So, number one, believe. Number two, be persistent. Nag, nag, nag. And number three, be specific. That's what you do when you're crying out for your prayers to be answered. The reason I experienced the love of God is because that was the main thing that he heard me ask for every time I, I prayed a prayer. I said, Lord, I don't love you. I don't know you. I want to know you. I want to love you. Yeah, Lord, save my sister, save my brother. But, but bottom line, I want to know you and I want to know you love me. That was my biggest urgency. God gave me that answer. I didn't say, oh, I know you ain't got time for me. I'm just a nobody. No, I didn't go there. I nagged him for it. Are you nagging him? Are you being specific? Huh? And where you have doubts, are you asking God to help you in your area of faith? That's it in a nutshell, y'all. So don't complain. 
Don't grumble. Don't gripe. But believe. The ones that got their prayers answered were those that believed, not the ones that said, oh, you ain't going to do that for me. The ones that said they ain't going to do it, they didn't make it into the promised land. You notice that in the Old Testament. So you have to, even if you feel it, say, Lord, I'm feeling doubtful, but I'm asking you to help me. Help my faith. Give me some type of reassurance. You got to nag them for that too. Everything you need, you got to nag him for. God bless you. Be encouraged. And whatever you do, don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Don't hang your head down. Walk away with your tail tucked between your legs and throw your hands up and just quit. No, you fight for what you want. Amen? Amen.